session will cover Campaign 101, The Nuts and Bolts. My name is Yandere Chatwin, Chair of the 2021 Real Women Run Organizing Committee. And on behalf of the committee and YWCA Utah, thank you so much for being with us today. I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know what part of Utah you're joining from today. That's always one of my favorite parts of these webinars is seeing where everyone's tuning in from. Real Women Run is a collaborative, nonpartisan initiative of YWCA Utah that is led by a dynamic organizing committee. These committed volunteers have taken on the challenges presented by the pandemic and have used them as an opportunity to reimagine our programming to be even more inclusive, not just for 21, but beyond. Um, today, I also want to highlight and thank Christy Glass, who's the chair of this committee, for her leadership um, this year. A special thank you to this year's Rural Women Run sponsors, Rocky Mountain Power and the Salt Lake Board of Realtors. And now just a quick housekeeping item before we begin. Um, we plan to have time for questions at the end, so please be sure to drop your questions into the chat, and we'll try to make sure we get as many of them as possible. I'm now going to turn the time over to Cheryl Allen, a former state representative and a member of our Real Women Run Committee, who has led the efforts to plan today's session. Cheryl will be moderating today's conversation, and she is going to introduce our distinguished guest. Cheryl, the time is yours. Thank you, Yandri. And thanks to a former uh, representative and state senator, Patrice Arendt, for being with us, and former representative Becky Edwards. Uh, these ladies are still doing good things, and uh, more things to come from them, no question about it. Um, I want to let our guests introduce themselves, but let me just give this little opening statement. I had the pleasure of working with both these ladies, and you are about to hear from the best of the best. Uh, these two ladies served in the Utah legislature. They were known for being smart. More importantly, they were known for being wise. They were very dedicated to their public service position and they were respected across the aisle by, I can say this with conviction, all their peers. And with that, let's start out by having them take two to three minutes and introduce themselves. And then we're going to get to the campaign political questions. So uh, Patrice will go alphabetically right now. Would you introduce yourself for two or three minutes, please? Thank you so much, Cheryl. And Cheryl was one of my mentors. So anything that I accomplished at the Capitol, I really have a lot to thank her for. And also I want to note, she wasn't just a legislator, she was also a candidate for Lieutenant Governor of our state. So really an accomplished person who's done so much in our community. Uh, I was raised here, um, grew up in Utah and then left Salt Lake to never come back where I went to Cornell Law School and lived in some other places. Uh, before that, I had worked as an intern for uh, Governor Matheson and Senator Moss. And also I was a member of the Office of Legislative Research and General Counsel. And the reason that's important is because I was a staffer and kind of saw the process from the inside and I knew that one person could truly make a difference. Um, I was the only staffer that actually ever moved on to being in the legislature. I was also kind of a policy wonk and really wanted to work with people and really wanted to help people in my district. Uh, when I first ran, uh, people just assumed I was kind of a name on the ballot because it was a very Republican district. Uh, there was a very popular Republican incumbent and I not only had only lived in the district for a few years, but I uh, didn't know what a community council meeting was was nursing my son during fun fundraising phone calls. And I, I tell you this to say that if I can do it, anybody can. But I'm just pleased to be here. Um, look forward to your questions and from what I'm going to learn from the other panelists. Thank you very much, Patrice. Becky? Well, my name is Becky Edwards and I had the privilege of working um, at the Capitol, serving at the Capitol with both Patrice and Cheryl, and Cheryl is uh, was serving in the district right next to mine. So we were fellow Davis County representatives, and I really had the great privilege of um, coming into the legislature from an area of Davis County that had had a series of strong women women serving: <clears throat> Cheryl Allen, Ann Hardy, Nancy Lyon. And my seat was actually, uh, I was replaced by a woman, Melissa Ballard. So in Davis County, we have a lot of women uh, representation and that has been a wonderful legacy that I've been uh, lucky to serve in. Um, I grew up in Provo. I'm a Utah uh, 
for for many, many years. In fact, the other day I figured out for over half a century, which makes me sound like um, a, a tree, like an oak tree or something. For half a century, I've lived in the state of Utah and um, and really been happy and proud to do so. Um, after growing up in Provo and going to BYU, um, married my husband and we lived in Salt Lake and Seattle and New York City and Alabama and moved back here to a uh, bountiful area and have lived here ever since. We have four children, nine grandchildren and uh, served in the Utah house from 2008, sorry, 2009 until 2018. Uh, my service ended in December of 2018, and at that point, about five months later, my husband and I went uh, to Samoa to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we returned a couple of months ago. So you can imagine the the shock it is this morning to be dealing with snow in mid-April here, uh, which is very, very normal, and we love it. Um but and we have we've been happy to be home uh, to leave a home and a people that we love in Samoa to return to a people and home that we love, and my service in the in the legislature was very much a, a outgrowth of the community involvement and advocacy that I'd been doing for years um, just in my my neighborhood and my community and has been um, a great springboard to take that into just a different realm of. Uh, public policy and elected office. Thank you both. That's a good segue into our next question. We know there's actually been a lot of research on um, women running for office and how they differ from men. And we know that women really have to think that, and have the self-confidence that they're prepared, whatever prepared means. So my next question, and we'll start with you, Becky, is um, was that a problem for you? Did you feel prepared when you first ran for the legislature? Uh, and, and did you go on in, in spite of that or because of that? You no, know, in, in some ways, a little bit of both. Um, I Like I say, I've been doing a lot of just volunteering in schools in my community and my church doing things and advocacy work on issues that I cared about a lot uh, but I had not been in the workforce for many years my my uh, background is as a master's of social work and a master's of marriage and family therapy and I worked in that field for a long time which just parenthetically ended up being a really great background for for dealing with diverse groups with different goals and bringing people together and working for solutions, not unlike when you're you're a person or a family in in a state of crisis or or dysfunction. So it ended up being a really great background. But I had not had formal work training or been involved for for many years. And and at first I did feel like, have I have I the expertise? See, like Patrice had been in the field of. Uh, politics and as an attorney, she had had that consistent that consistent work. I hadn't, and it's easy to to feel. And I did feel at the beginning like I don't know if I'm prepared from a professional standpoint. But one thing I never ever lost sight of was the number one role of a legislator, which is to represent the voice of the people. That I knew I had above the speaker's chair. In the this house gallery is the phrase vox populi, which means voice of the people. And to truly represent the voice of the people, I knew I had that. I knew that was the number one important thing. And I felt prepared because of being in my community and engaging on issues and with people that I felt were important. And and the the rest of it ended up not not even being a, a concern because really truly representing your neighbors and your people in your community that is if that's something that you're already doing it's a very natural transition and that's the best background that you can have thank you becky patrice you told us a little bit about your um, rich professional background but do you want to elaborate on this question how prepared do women need to be to run for office you know it's interesting i never hear a man ask that question they just think they're prepared and they, no matter what they've been doing, they may have no background, they may not have 
graduated from high school, but they think they're prepared. You don't hear this question when I'm training them. Um, so I think that, yes, I had some background in some areas, but I didn't know a lot about other things. I remember walking in my first day and I'd been working in the area of natural resources and public utilities as the counsel in those fields. And I worked in the attorney general's office and somebody walked up to me with a really complicated healthcare question, assuming I knew the answer to it. And I was clueless. Uh, one of the things I've been working on for over the last de uh, decade has been clean air and trying to reduce air pollution. When I first got into, involved in that, I didn't have a clue what caused it or what was going on. I just realized that I could talk to experts and learn from people and have amazing co-chairs of our Clean Air Caucus like Representative Becky Edwards. So that, you know, there really is a lot you can learn. You don't need to come in totally prepared. Um, you'll never know all the issues, but you learn what you can. And when a constituent calls, you can often learn so much from them. Uh, so many of the things I got to work on were because of constituents who were experts and helped train me. And that really made a difference. And I would bring people into the room because I was used to doing this as an attorney who were on all sides of an issue and we would all educate each other. Um, and I think that's an important part of the process. So it's not knowing everything. It's not being prepared. I mean, heaven knows when I was sitting there nursing my son, making fundraising phone calls, and I was doing that because it kept him quieter. Um, <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting myself involved in. I, I will tell you one funny story. I, as I was knocking on doors, there would be people that said, I'm sorry, I can't vote for you because you're a woman. And that year I was running against the former state PTA president who was a woman. I said, well, you're going to have to choose one of us or not vote at all. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Patrice. Um, both of you ladies have been extremely successful in your political runs, but are there benefits to running? from your perspective, whether you win or lose. Patrice, do you wanna take that first? Well, there are so many benefits. I mean, every, I've had so, a number of races where no one thought I could win, probably including me. Uh, but you, you learn about yourself and your own values. You get to meet absolutely wonderful people and learn more about your community. I actually think campaigning is fun. This past year, and I, I wasn't running, but I was working with many candidates. It wasn't as much fun because knocking on doors was a little scary during the pandemic. There are all those wonderful community events you got to go to weren't happening, but really it's fun. You, you get people who will come and support you. And I've always enjoyed it. And, you know, I've had races where I never knew what was going to come out, but I felt like I accomplished a lot. And maybe as a result of it, I see the world a little differently. Thank you, Becky. You know, one of the real positives of, of running for office is the team that you surround yourself with and the impact that that has. And I think anyone who's ever run realizes this is not a solo event. This is not a sport for one. You bring in people who, who support you and people who learn along the way as well. So on, in our first campaign, my I had um, a daughter who was 18, who was my campaign manager. We figured that out together. We didn't know, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you're in the middle of it. Another daughter of mine was 14 years old. It was my youngest daughter. And she went around door to door for me and, and she and her friends and neighbor kids and friends of friends and, and the young people who were engaged and have been engaged in my campaigns have had their eyes open to the possibilities of their future engagement, their future involvement, and the power of one, the power of a, of a voice, the power of a vote as an elected person. And it opened up realms of possibility for them that I've seen them take now in their life trajectory. It's been a game changer for them to see, oh, this is something that Jane's mom did. She's, she's the one who's making us cookies on the weekend and I, you know, driving us to carpool and i mean it it humanized the the process of running for office and made it seem like these are regular people you do not need to be um intimidated or fearful of this of this process that has been really fun to see that uh play out in all of the, the young people especially who have been engaged and so yeah even if even if you're the votes do not come out your way. 
I would never say that you win or lose in an election. I would just say the votes didn't didn't end in your favor, but you never lose when you run. You always win. And let me just add one thing. There are people that run multiple times. And sometimes it isn't the first time they win. We have a new representative this year. This is her third race. She didn't come out ahead the first two, but now she's serving in the legislature. Thank you for those comments. Um, we also know that women are worried about the time commitment. And usually you hear they're more worried about the time commitment of running than serving. Uh, both are very time consuming. But uh, let me just give a little background. Becky Edwards, a Republican, lived in an area that's primarily Republican. And so her challenges and most intense time commitment, I presume, came in the June primary and the, the conventions prior to that. Patrice always had a very challenging race in November. She would always be in a swing district. Um, so you, uh, you're listening to two ladies with two different kinds of election experiences, which is good. So having said that, would you comment please on the time commitment to run and then if you want to about the time commitment to serve nowadays. Uh, Becky, let's start with you, please. So the time commitment to run is really a, um, I think you have to really make a commitment that you are all in. This is as much time. If you have time, you spend it on your campaign if it's important to you. I don't think anyone is is going to run just because it's a good experience or just because, you know, it'd be like, of something on a bucket list, oh, that'll be fun to do. No, when you run, you put your hat in the ring. Any minute you have, any effort you have, you're going to put that towards your race. Um, and I'd say because we did primarily have the focus on a primary race, the general election was not as strong of a, of a I guess, competition here in Davis County. Uh, probably it was, like I say, every single I'm going to say every single minute of every single day, but you know, free time that you had that you could devote to it, you were spending, and that would be from um, from January till till June, uh, building up, of course, towards the the convention. Uh, my first two elections were pre-signature gathering, so those delegates and those those elections. Uh, maybe his first three, those mattered. And you're meeting with delegates, you're making phone calls, you're preparing yourself with with knowledge on different issues. Uh, and we always ran a, an effort in the November election too, because out of respect of the system, it I don't think a Democrat had been elected in Davis County for uh, in a house race in our area for a long time. But out of respect for the system, and we always had a Democrat opponent, and I loved engaging with them because voters need to know that this is this process is respectful and necessary to have a multitude of voices, and that matters, um, and it helps people feel empowered to share their voice as well. But it's it's worth expending as much energy and time as you can. Uh, so whatever the result is, you feel like you did everything you could. Thank you. Patrice. Well, my races were always hard. The first race I was given no chance at all. And I um, just had with the name on the ballot. And then the next two, I was the number one target of the state Republican party. And then the race after that, um, I'd been redistricted off the map, the district I represented. And so I decided to run against the Senate majority leader in a super Republican district. So I have never really had particularly easy races. One year, however, my opponent showed up 15 minutes late at the county clerk's office and um, was not able to file. There are strict rules in our laws about what time you have to file. But even that year, I knocked on doors because I think it's important to have people see you even if you don't have a race. I think it's what Becky has said is absolutely right. It's, it's a respect for the process and you learn from people. I love just listening. There's so much you can learn. Um, 
you know, in terms of the amount of time, I did spend a lot of time and I wasn't, I've been known for the person that works the hardest. And it actually discouraged some competitors who would later tell me, yeah, I was going to run against you, but I knew it wasn't kind of a part-time deal because you work really hard. That being said, I have colleagues that, you know, they were working full-time jobs, they have kids and they still pull it off. I mean, you can really do that. We have single parents at the legislature, they pull it off. We have people with very young children, they pull it off. So it can be done, but it does take a lot of time and serving takes a lot of time. I will say that you are, you've got two women that work harder at the legislature than most ever have. I think I would always admire Becky. She was giving tours and sending out messages multiple times a day to her constituents. It seemed like she was just doing everything. And I know I tried to stay in contact with my uh, con constituents as much as I could too. I have a very active district of constituents that were constantly contacting me. So, you know, it's time when you're in the session, it's time when you're running. And it's also time, you a lot of time the rest of the year because, you know, there are special sessions and interim meetings and people that just want to reach out to you. It's not full time the rest of the year, but there's a commitment there. Thank you, Patrice. Um, another important consideration, uh, and you certainly know this, uh, if you're uh, thinking about running for office, is the cost, because campaigns cost money. Um, we know that once you're an incumbent, raising money is easier. But go back and think back to that first time around that you ran. A, and I should, I should clarify that. It's never really easy, but it is a little bit easier if you're incumbent. What advice do you have for our listeners about the cost, how you raise that money, and priorities in spending it? Patrice, let's start with you, please. Um, I actually was not the incumbent in a couple of races. The first time when absolutely no one had heard of me. And then when I was running against the Senate Majority Leader, people, even though I was in House leadership, there were people that were reluctant to want to be on my campaign finance disclosure because at, you know, no one thought I would win and they didn't want to get the Senate majority leader mad at them. The cost of your race so much depends on your opponent, where you're running, if it's going to be over at the primary, if you're going to have to run a big general election campaign. You know, I, I put up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lawn signs and, you know, sent out brochures and did t-shirts and I usually ran it an expensive campaign. That being said, it wasn't a dime of my own money. I raised it from people. And who do you raise it from? Not necessarily from people in your district, not necessarily from some list you got from somebody else who ran. You start out with people you know, wherever they live, you know, great uncle so-and-so in Minnesota or whomever you can find. And the personal phone calls are the best. Uh, yes, you can send out letters and personalize the letters if you can. And that, that's helpful. But making those calls, those fundraising calls, there's just, and follow up, you know, you know, here's nice to talk to you, you know, here's where you contribute, here's my website, you know, all of those things, really very important to have that. And in terms of prioritizing how you spend it, and I don't want, you know, I teach classes just on all of this. So I'm trying to keep this down to just a few minutes. Um, yesterday I was on a webinar and they said, don't put up lawn signs. And I just about fell over in my chair and said, excuse me, because there are a lot of studies out there that say lawn signs don't make as big of a difference in big campaigns, US Senate campaigns, that they're not as persuasive. Well, all the footnotes say that's not true in state and local races. Um, those are important. Um, being at events is important. Uh, we have a little event every week in, in my area called Venture Out. And it's you know an event in the park where they have movie and music and food and all of that. Yes, you rent a table and you're there. And you, if you can afford it, people are wearing campaign t-shirts. And even if they're not wearing campaign t-shirts, they've got on stickers, big stickers, so people know who they're working with. You know, so there are things like that and there's, you know, that you can spend money on too. I've never spent money on a fancy campaign headquarters. It was always in my house, in my basement. Um, never did anything like that because I, it wasn't necessary. I know others would disagree. And sometimes my family might've disagreed. <laughs> because everybody was everywhere but um you know it, there are that you can raise the money women do, in fact it's really interesting if you look at the numbers women do not have problems raising money it's just knowing the techniques knowing how to make those calls doing the follow-up 
all of that, it really can happen. You have to also look at where you're going to get your bang for your buck. Having events to raise money, if you're paying for those events and helping to organize them on an hour to hour basis is not as um, fruitful in terms of raising money, although it certainly can get your ID out there and have other purposes, but not in terms of raising money. It's much better if you're running a legislative campaign to do the calls and the follow-ups and have your friends make calls. You've got a good committed friend. Maybe they can say, hey, I, I know Patrice, she's running. She'd be great. Can you chip in for that? And when you make those calls, have an idea of what you're going to ask for. If it's somebody who can really afford to give to you, don't ask them for $25 and educate them on what the costs are because sometimes people think $25 goes a long way. Um, don't ask them for a million dollars if you think they're going to fall off their chair. And, you know, you, you want to kind of find that sweet spot. And if they say, no, I really can't do that much this time, say, well, how about this? And we'll put you down for this. And maybe later on in the campaign, you can help me a little more. But really don't just go in and ask for money, ask for an amount. Very good. Thank you, Patrice. Just a little footnote to what she said. Um, I left the legislature 10 years prior to Patrice leaving the legislature. And Patrice lives in a different part of the valley than I do. But when I would see her two or three times a year, she would verbally tell me, truthfully, that she was going to have a hard race, because she always did, and ask for money. And because you need, which I admire, it's what women have to do. I never found it offensive, but she was taking an opportunity to see a friend and letting a friend know that once again, she had a, fry, a, a very difficult race and help would be appreciated. And that's what women need to do. Becky, please take it from here. Absolutely. I think the the ability to ask for, for money with a specific amount and even tie it to $25 means five lawn signs, right. uh, $50 means, you know, 10 t-shirts, whatever it is. I think people like knowing what the money's going for and how it will help you. Um, and you can start just like Patrice said with your Christmas card list and, and making those personal phone calls, giving an amount and letting them know what they can, what the money can be used for. In terms of how much it would cost, you can look at previous races in your area. That's all on the Lieutenant Governor's campaign um, disclosure site. And you can see, oh, previously people spent $20,000 on this race or 80,000 or whatever it is. And, and again, it depends on where you are in the state and the competitiveness of, of your area. Some, some races are, are just naturally going to be more expensive and for, for you as a candidate, one of the most important things is to make a plan, how much you think you can bring in, how much you can contribute, and then make a campaign plan. One mailer is going to cost, I'll just say $5,000. And if you're going to bring, if your campaign can only spend $20,000, how much of that 20 is going to go to lawn signs, other campaign t-shirt paraphernalia, stickers, et cetera, um, flyers. And then the use of social media has sort of democratized the whole campaign, you can get a lot of bang for your buck with social media resources that you you could not um, reach the same kind of thing maybe 10, 15 years ago. So that has made it easier to get a message out for, for a lot less money. One thing I would really caution is once you make your plan, raise your money and then stick with your plan. Do not get caught up in the fear the last week of the campaign um, that you've got to, you know, spend more. And I've heard so many stories of people then putting in more of their own money, like last minute panic. I just need one more flyer. I just need one more, whatever. And also the money that's being spent by your opponent. Um, I had three primary races and in two of my primaries, uh, there were outside groups that came in and poured in a ton of money into these campaigns. Very unusual for our part of the state. We don't, we don't spend a ton in our, our area because we're, we're very grassroots oriented. And so that was a big focus for me as well is get out, knock doors. Those are the most effective and that's free. Knocking doors is free. Um, and it, it was very concerning. How would we be able to impact or counterbalance the money that was being poured in by the tens of thousands of dollars on these other opponents? And in the end, 
we stuck with our message and redoubled the things that were free, redoubled knocking on doors, redoubled phone calls. And it there is a way to run a race um, without overspending what your capacity for fundraising is. So do not be seduced into thinking you need to spend more money than you can bring in, but also be empowered that you can probably bring in more money than you're anticipating and be aggressive about doing that um, on behalf of your campaign, but also on behalf of every single person in your district who's going to be benefited with you in office speaking for them. I forgot to add one really important thing, and this is something that you can never, ever neglect. If somebody gives you $5, if somebody gives you $1,000, they always get a personal thank you note. Yes. Always, always. It doesn't need to be long. And my handwriting got pretty bad. So, so I had kind of a form uh, that we sent out and I personalized it, you know, or you can, in some cases, if they're giving online, even do a personal email, but always thank them. And I will say one thing that might be a little different. We knocked on every door. We never missed a door. We would go to doors twice, but there is an expense with going to door. And that is if you're not going to find somebody at home, which is, you know, at least half the time, I always left something on the door. And if I was signing it, I said, I'm sorry, I missed you. I would sign my name. I'd never wanted anyone to mislead someone. I didn't want them to put, sorry, I missed you if it wasn't me. And, you know, they're probably their ring would see somebody with blonde hair like Becky walk up and say, sure, Patrice stopped by. But then it was just, sorry, we missed you. And I would actually sometimes even comment so they knew I'd been at their house, love your beautiful tulips or something, you know, uh, something like that to really personalize it. But we always, when we printed our door hangers, left a space for me to write a note. That's a very good suggestion. And now uh, doorbell cameras are much more prominent. So they do know whether it's been you at the door or not. That's a very good point. Um, this is such good advice you're sharing with us. Uh, and you've been so positive because running for office can be challenging, but positive. But let's, let's concentrate on the challenges. Can you think in your campaigning of a particularly challenging problem that you had and how, what did you do about it? How did you solve it? Or, or did you exacerbate it? Becky? You know, I mentioned one of the, uh, in a couple of the primaries I had, there was some outside funding that came in and there was a series of uh, mailers that went out. They chose by my, by people supporting my opponent. I, I don't know that it was my opponent directly, but some of these out, like super PAC that came in and they chose like the absolute worst picture of me. Um, you know, I'm in this sort of gray, black and white picture looking mean and like a Ebenezer Scrooge, I'm going to take your tax dollars and, and all, you know, I mean, the worst possible spin on votes I'd made, on positions I'd taken, and it was like literally every other day and, um, and really misleading and personal attacks, it was, it was hard actually to see those because I don't think they were very smart. They actually included me on their mailing list. So I, maybe that was part of the plan, but it was, it was very hard to feel like, oh, we got to get back on here. We got to, you know, we got to answer these questions. I got to like really um, attack back hard because look at the, the flavor of our campaign has changed and I need to be responsive to that. And it was, when I say it was hard, it, it genuinely was. Uh, parenthetically, I, I was talking to my father-in-law who at the time was, um, was still with us. He's, he's since passed, but he had been, his profession was in football coaching and had served, uh, served he, his, he was a BYU football coach for many years. And I remember uh, at a family dinner once saying, oh, Lavelle, you just can't believe how negative this stuff is. It's just so mean and they're just so hard. They're saying stuff that's not even true. And I'm, and he's like, yeah, I understand, Becky. And I'd say, no, no, but I don't think you really do understand this and this and this and in the newspaper and it's so hard and I feel so attacked. He's like, yeah, I, 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 I do understand. And, and I'm like, no, 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 you really don't. And finally said, yeah, I do. Here's my advice. He said, every time we lose a game, I see the same things happening to me. He said, just stop reading it. Becky, it's easy. Just don't read your press. Just don't read that stuff. 
And I'll tell you the same thing that, that we do on the BYU football team. We stick with our game plan. And that was really impactful for me. Um, and rather than trying to respond with the uh, same tenor that had been coming our way, we stuck with our game plan, focused on what, what I could do, focused on positives, focused on our message, and um, it ended up being successful. But that was like really a pivot point for me to remember, be, be true and authentic to who you are as a candidate, who you are as a person, and do not be blown about by the winds of um, the different messages that will come during a campaign. Excellent advice. Patrice, please take it. And I want to tell people that what happened to Becky is not your typical legislative race. Having that kind of outside money come in is really unusual. But when I was running against the Senate Majority Leader, he did have a ton of money because it wasn't hard for him to raise money. He had paid walkers knocking on doors and all of that. And I had kind of a few incidents where I was accused of things. And one, one postcard came out and it was supposedly one of those just fat, factual cards that showed my record. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, I wouldn't even vote for me. And I think it's good to know at least what's out there. His mistake was sending it too early. So this is in all of my years, I don't usually respond to these things, but that year I had to respond and I, you know, did a little cute cards, facts and fiction and, you know, pointed out a few of his errors. But we had other, another day when my daughter, and they were spreading a lot of rumors about me. She came home from high school and said, mom, I hear there's an abortion clinic in our basement. And I'm like, oh. Just like a few minutes later, KSL TV showed up at my door over another controversy. And I said, well, while you're here, you know, I answered that. I'd love to show you my campaign headquarters. And I walked them through my basement and had them take video of every single room. So at least they had it in case, you know, we needed it for later. I remember when my daughter did say that to me, I just said, it kind of had it that day. And I said, just go hire some doctors. <laughs> yeah. um, the other little problem that I would have, and it, it would happen to a lot of um people running, Democrats running in suburban areas like mine that were not like running in the avenues, is that your volunteers, well-meaning, would show up in their short shorts and their low t-shirts and lots of tattoos and nose rings, and that didn't go over too well in my district. So trying to figure out how to handle, you know, kind of talking to them, and you know, or having a volunteer, letting them know in advance that it's a conservative area, and so you know, we need to dress appropriately. I would give them t-shirts. Um, I actually had a campaign manager with tattoos that we had to make, he had to wear a long sleeve t-shirt even in the summer because it just didn't go over in my district. And if they came and it, it wasn't a way that we could really fix the situation, we had a, an emergency project that needed to be done that night that had to do with stuffing envelopes or something. But um, it sounds really little and really dumb, but for some of us, it's a, it's a problem and you have to figure out in advance how you're going to deal with it. Okay, being prepared for e every kind of problem. Uh, even how do I tactfully get somebody to wear a long sleeve t-shirt? That's actually really good. Um, uh, we hope, all of us, that the listeners that we have are seriously contemplating running for office or helping another good candidate preferably a woman, but uh, good candidates, regardless of their gender, uh, helping a good candidate run for office because all of us here have not only run for office ourselves, but we spend a lot of time helping other people run for office and we know the importance of that volunteerism. What important advice do you have for our listeners uh, about running for office? What's your advice? What are the advantages? You've talked a little bit about that, but let's hit the nail on the head. And Patrice, start with you, please. Well, first of all, you should do it or help someone else, but be realistic about it. Um, make sure that you know what you're getting into, that you're there for the long haul and kind of what your plan is going to be and always seek advice. Um, talk to different people, like go to these seminars and talk to different people who've run and been successful those maybe who haven't been as successful and what they've learned so that you can learn from a variety of sources. But remember, be skeptical too. Just like yesterday, I heard that you don't need to use lawn signs. I kind of, no, that's not necessarily true. Uh, 
always be true to yourself and your values. I think that's so important. Don't come in and try and, you know, go to one door and say one thing and another door and say something else. Be consistent with what who you are. And when I was one of the things I did is I didn't want my volunteers to be telling people how I stood on things because first of all, it scared them off. Oh no, I've got to remember Patricia's position on this, 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 and this. It's just too hard to do. If someone asked them a substantive question, the answer was always the same. That's a great question. Here is Patrice's home phone number, cell phone number, whatever. Give her a call. Now, I didn't say, here, let me write down your number and she'll call you because I can promise you that's the person with the full voicemail that you can never get through to. But, um, or that was never set up their voicemail in the first, in the, at all. But if they know that they can call you, and rarely they do, but sometimes they do, it's a lot better than some volunteer trying to remember all your positions and getting it wrong. And the most important thing I think as a candidate is being willing to listen and having people know that you're willing to listen. That's so critical, but um, it's fun. And I hope that you can enjoy it as much as I have. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you ended that with your uh, enjoyment of running. Yes, it has its ups and downs, but overall it is enjoyable. Becky, would you comment, please? Becky, you're on mute. There go. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I always enjoyed doing was speaking to elementary school groups and, you know, talking to like a group of fifth and sixth graders about what it means to serve in the in the legislature and and kind of trying to liken it to something with in their experience and if they were most elementary schools have some kind of a student council and and they always have you know what are the problems in your school you want to solve and boy they had a million problems they want to see chocolate milk every single day no regular milk at lunch they want to have longer recesses they want it there are a lot of things that issues that really matter to them and we talk about well how do you solve those problems who, who should be making those decisions? And, and they would get it and they would really get energized about stuff that mattered to them. This is, this is actually just a build on, on those same kind of motivations, the same things that drive you in your regular life to be involved and, and make a difference that you're already doing. You're already an influencer in your own sphere of of with your community, your your church, your uh, neighborhood, your family, whatever, you already have opinions, you already care, you already have people that listen to you and look to you and that you work with to solve problems. And just like I would say to you know elementary school kids, do you like solving problems? Do you like um, helping people? Do you like sometimes, and especially to like certain elementary school kids, do you like being bossy sometimes? Do you like, to, you know, and then they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom says I'm bossy. My teacher says I'm bossy a lot. I'm like, actually, that's called leadership. <laughs> like, if you are, a, a, you know, someone who can marry that with listening, then you are the perfect person for this. And for, you know, whether it's elementary school council, uh, student council, or the state legislature, or any other position in between, it is, it's a, it's a, duty. It's a wonderful privilege. And it is such a great opportunity to represent, to truly represent the people in your, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, in your town. It is a wonderful privilege. You will learn so much and your family may get tired of you saying, hey, listen, in this transportation committee today, here's what we discussed about Wasatch Front Regional Center. And this is what they're doing and this new freeway and blah. And they may just say, stop, this is too much because every single committee you're on, every single conversation you have, whether it is at the door with a constituent, when you're knocking doors to try and get elected, whether it's in a committee, you will learn so many interesting cool things that you never knew before and that are relevant in your your area your family families around you and you will be um so glad you did because the ability you will have to make a difference in this area and then take that baton and pass it on to someone else when you're finished with your service it's the 
it's the great American experiment come to come to fruition in your own life. It's a tremendous privilege. And I just could not encourage you more strongly to do it. Um, take what you what your strengths are and what your interests are and be true to those and uh, have a wonderful experience. You will not regret it. Thank you. That is, uh, you both of you ladies have been so interesting, so specific, yet very positive. And I think that people that have run for office almost generally really emphasize the positive that comes from running. Um, and so I, but I commend you. I told you we were going to listen to the best of the best. And, and we have. With that, I know we have a lot of questions that have come through. Yandri, um, I asked you and Amberly if you would particularly pay attention to those questions because I wanted to concentrate on what these ladies were saying. Would you like to address some of the questions uh, and pose it to these our two guests? Yes, absolutely. The first question we got, it was from Amber McSee, and she addressed, addressed it to Becky. Um, but I'm going to open it up to Patrice as well, because I, I know you faced this. But how did you respond to personal attacks? And uh, I'll, I'll give Becky a moment first and then turn it to Patrice. It, I think you have to realize it's partly the arena you're, you're in. And that most of the time, those attacks are, are intended to get a response. And that's when you get, that's when you personally get in trouble because you get off your own message. So really to try and stay true to your own message um, is, is important. We did try and work with, I think I mentioned my 14 year old daughter in my first campaign, she would go door to door and she was, um, she's a passionate, she was a passionate 14 year old and now she's in second year of law school uh, back in New York. But she, as a 14 year old was extremely loyal loved her mother, loved everything I stood for. And on occasion, she, and we had trained her, when you go to door to door, if they say they hate me, if they say they do not, they would never vote for me, you say, thank you very much. Thank you for supporting democracy. Please make sure you get out and vote and turn around and walk away. Do not get into a thing with anybody at the door. Well, on occasion, um, a 14 year only, old only has so much self-discipline and there were times she would come home and we would have a, you know, how was the conversation at the doors? And she said, oh, Mr. So-and-so at this, I just, oh, just had to talk to him and, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said this and this. And I said, show me where it is on the map. Okay. We're going to be taking that man some cookies. Go make some cookies. We're going to be going back to that door. And she and I would go back to that door together and have a conversation with Mr. So-and-so, who was very passionately arguing with a 14-year-old. So you have to, and that only happened a few times, but uh, that, and what ended up happening was that, in, that very individual who was so vociferously arguing with my 14-year-old uh, ended up being one of my greatest supporters. So sometimes it's just conversations. Don't be afraid to follow through with someone who does have a personal attack and, and question why. You know, I'm getting that question a lot more than I did in the past. And it's mostly as a result of a congressional campaign that took place in my district with Ben McAdams and, uh, and Congressman Owens. And I will tell you, that's not what happens when you run for the legislature. They're not these horrible TV attacks and things like that. It really is not as common as you think. And there are a few of those doors, not that many. Usually they'll, you can tell they don't love you, but you know, they're, they're not going to attack you at their door. And it's, it's mostly just people being kind and fun and all of that. And I love Becky's comment about bringing the cookies back. I would also ask people to write down if they had a particular home that was a problem. And sometimes we would try and figure out a better way to, to reach them. And I even went to the doors with my opponent's sign up. And often it was like, oh yeah, somebody from my church told me to put it up and I'm not a member of the church. So, you know, uh, but anyway, they, they, so I didn't know that it happened that they were, somebody was saying from the pulpit, here's, a, you know, pick up your signs after they're out in the back, you know, by the parking lot. Oh, great. So, and when I talked to them, they said, yeah, we really don't like him. And occasionally they would even ask me to take them down and I would never take down my opponent's sign 
nor would I ever let anyone from my campaign do that. So all we need is a nice little video going up on YouTube of us taking down a lawn sign, even when it was requested that we do it. So never, never, never do that. But, um, you know, just listen to people and be willing to listen and to talk to them. And even if they, you think they're supporting the, your opponent, they may not be. Thank you both, that's really great advice. Um, I have a question from Christina now. She said, what are your thoughts on not being a longtime native? I've only been in Utah for seven years and I'm curious how that might affect a campaign. I want to make a difference and will use focus groups to get local opinion, but I'm concerned about not being a local myself. What would you all say to Christina? I've seen people be very successful who have not been in Utah any longer than Christina has been here. Uh, get to know your local issues. I've never had to worry about focus groups, but if you, it's an, and that's an expensive use of your money, but go to your community council meetings and listen and learn from the people in the, your area. I wouldn't emphasize it when you're running. I can't believe how many brochures will, someone will say, yes, I recently moved here from you know Connecticut. No, don't put that on your brochure. Um, you know, just leave that in, if anyone asks and just say, I love you, you know, you just if people ask, I love living here, it's important, you know, I love this community. You don't need to get into how long you've lived here. Yeah, I think one of the things uh, with that situation is you really do have an interesting perspective because you have fresh eyes to look at problems. And sometimes we, be, we have blind spots that they, we don't notice or recognize ourselves because we've lived someplace for a really long time and things just seem like they're, that's the normal, that's the, the way almost expected. And so you have a, a fresh set of eyes on issues and I think that can be really a beneficial thing. And rather than focus groups or in addition, another idea would be to, to have like a listening tour, town halls, cottage meetings, whatever with people in your, in your neighborhood, in the district that you're thinking of serving and just listen to them. What are the biggest issues? What are the boundaries? What are the barriers? What can the state do differently for you? What would you like to see? And I think those those individuals will be so surprised to have that opportunity to visit with you. You may gain some tremendous supporters in that way and also learn, learn a ton yourself. So I would not let that dissuade you at all. That is great advice. Christina, I hope you'll consider what these two women have said and will decide to jump in. Uh, our next question is from Katie. She says, is there such a thing as campaigning too early? My city's campaign season seems to have started very early this year, and I'm concerned about burning residents in my district out if I start too early. Uh, what would you all say to Katie? Well, Katie, first of all, do you have anyone else running? Will there be a primary? I mean, there's things like that you need to think about. Um, I'm seeing people out early and earlier every year. Uh, when I first started, you didn't put up your lawn signs until after Labor Day, not the case anymore. But I don't think it's too early now to do things like listening, to start talking to people. And it also depends on where you're running. Um, you know, to get around a state Senate race, it takes a long time to knock on all those doors. So be cautious in terms of COVID. You know, you don't want people to get the wrong impressions from that. So, you, you know, you want to be safe and all of those things too. Um, and last year when people were knocking on doors when they felt like they could, they would literally go put the brochure on the door, ring the doorbell and step back, you know, 10 feet and see if anyone would wanted to talk to them. And they actually would even have a canned short message to put into the ring if, you know, that, that was the only way to get through to people if they weren't answering their doors. But I don't think it's too early yet. I really don't. And it, again, it depends on the race and it depends on where you're running. If you're running for the Boulder City Council in a town of 300, okay, maybe it's a little too early. <laughs> I think for for any race, one of the most important things, and you can start this as early as you're interested or able, is to do those listening conversations in people's living rooms. And those can start those can start anytime you're you're able and interested in in getting going with it. And I would just put out a word of caution in terms of um, again, having a campaign plan and, and sticking with that, following that campaign plan so that you don't find yourself at the end out of money and out of energy. You want to have, remember it's a marathon, regardless of if it's a three month marathon or a nine month marathon, 10, whatever, make sure that you have planned, uh, for, um, emotional resources and energy resources, as well as financial resources to stay the course until the very end. 
the other thing is you might just want to be showing up at community events so that people get to know you there. Mm -hmm. If there's a community council meeting, but let me give you a piece of advice. Don't just show up, have no one hear from you and not be wearing a name tag. So what, what was the point? No one even knew you were there. So I would always go in with a big magnetic name tag on and I would find some issue to speak on briefly so people knew that I had attended. Yeah, we have time for one more question. I was gonna add, um, if you do maybe you live in an area where you feel it might be a little early to start actually engaging actively, it's never too early to fundraise. So keep that in mind that there's always something you can be doing for your campaign even if you live in Boulder in a town of 300 and you're running for the city council. Um, county council. Uh, county <laughs> council, thank you. <laughs> Our last question uh, from Christina. What were the most common questions you received from voters along the way? I think this is a great one as candidates start thinking about how to prepare for those doorsteps and those interactions at, at local meetings. What was your experience? Becky, you want to go first? Yeah. I think uh, sometimes people are really issue dependent. They're they're very they're one issue voters, so they'll they'll want to know how do you feel about um, you know the drying up of the Great Salt Lake because we live close to that area, or or the the new freeway overpass that they're proposing and Center Street in North Salt Lake. They'll have like very specific things. And so sometimes you end up educating people. Well, that really is like a city issue or that's a federal issue or whatever. So you kind of sift through some of some of uh, concerns that really don't deal with your, your area of, of influence. Um, but I think most people want to know why you're running and have a, a 30 second um, explanation of why you're running. And then a deeper, like three minute explanation, maybe pick three, three or four issues that are really important to you. And those can come from um, things that are already important to you. They can come from some of these conversations you're having with, with influencers in your area. Um, but those, those are, those are sort of the main things is have three or four things that you're already um, interested in that you can share and then also be able to sift through the different layers of government, city, county, state, federal, and help people understand and be even a resource to help them kind of seek um, rec you know, some kind of a help in those areas in the different area, the different layers of government. I think actually candidates try to become policy wants too much and they try at the door to give way too much detail when we are living in a soundbite world. So yes, I would go up, I would an, you know, I would do my best to answer questions briefly. If I got caught at a door where somebody really wanted to talk to me for 20 minutes, usually I would have a volunteer kind of walking on the other side of the street and they would come up and say, we really need to get up here, they're waiting for you or whatever. Or, and I would do, very politely say, great question, can we talk on the phone later? Here's my phone number. Uh, but 99% of the people don't want a long conversation at the door. If they're, you know, yes, you should know a few issues that you care about and why you're running. And if you've gone to a few community council meetings, you'll get a feel for the big issues in your area, whether for me, it's, you know, what they're doing at Mill Creek Canyon or whatever. So you at least are familiar with it, but don't spend too much time trying to learn all of the details of the education budget and the transportation budget and all of those things when you're a candidate. That time will be much better spent raising money and knocking on doors. Have some basics, but don't go into excruciating detail. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that mistake from people running. That is incredibly reassuring advice. <laughs> thank you to both of you. And thank you so much to Cheryl as well, all three of you for your thought provoking, informative comments and for your time. We're so lucky to have heard from three amazing experts and women who, who have a track record of winning and um, being incredible community leaders. Um, and thank you to our, our members and our audience for being with us. Thank you to those who submitted questions. I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to all of them today. I want to make sure that you're aware that our next event in our webinar series will be on May 12th at noon, and it's called Running and Winning from the Margins. This is um, an attempt to, <laughs> for us to virtually replicate what we typically call our kaleidoscope perception. Typically in a normal year, we'd be having these events in person. And this event is specifically designed to address the unique challenges 
facing candidates of color, LGBTQ plus candidates, and candidates from other historically marginalized communities. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I'll be moderating the next panel, but our guests are fantastic. You will get to hear from Salt Lake City Council Chair Amy Fowler, Murray City Council Member Rosalba Dominguez, and Mill Creek City Council Member Bev Leapy. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Um, again, thank you so much, Cheryl, Patrice, and Becky for being with us. Thank you to our audience members, and we hope we see you in May. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So much.